My name is Herb Schwartz. I started on June 1st, 1959. I, I was a wage and salary analyst, analyst when I started. Uh, I spent four or five years doing wage and salary work, uh, including uh, being a wage and salary manager. Uh, in Florida, uh, I spent th three years as an administrative manager and one year as a technical manager where I ran the PMEL, a Precision Measurement Equipment Lab, uh, where we did, the, we calibrated all the test equipment on the range and we calibrated all of the test equipment for the range users, like companies like Boeing and Martin and uh, Raytheon. Raytheon and Thiokol, those companies. Uh, we were relocated back to New Jersey in 1966. I was a wage and salary manager in Cherry Hill for two years. And then I found a job I really liked in marketing, now called business development, where I managed uh, the preparation of proposals to the federal government uh, for, for GE government services. Uh, I also uh, manage a small group of uh, marketing slash proposal managers. Uh, and after GE merged with RCA, I continued in the same, same role until 1992 when I took a retirement basically to get the lump sum because the lump sum was frozen as of 1988. Uh, I continued working as a consultant uh, or as a part-timer, depending on uh, what the GE uh, legal people required. And uh, also worked for uh, Martin and uh, Lockheed as pretty much part-time. Every year I worked fewer and fewer hours. And then I finally uh, retired in uh, 2009. My boss wanted to keep me to 2010 because <laughs> he wanted to have an 80-year-old employee. <laughs> but they had a big cutback, and, and it was either cut me or cut a full-time employee. So uh, I graciously retired again. And this is your wife, Sandy. Sandy, Sandy. yes. Okay. Um, Sandy, my... you're married to an RCA guy, but you also have a background. I definitely do. My father was a photophone engineer for RCA. He spent his time going to different movie houses to sync the sound to the, um, to the movie. And I vividly remember standing in front of some movie theaters, especially at Christmas time, and looking in the window and knowing that my father had something to do with this movie. It was, I was very proud. I was very young, but I still remember that. Then my stepfather, he started working for um, GE before he got out of college and then went to work for them. My mother, after my real father died in 1943, we had been moved back to Camden. She was a dress woman in Camden after he died, so that was from 44 until about 47, I guess. She married my stepfather, Ned Gary, and um, then, let's see, we had Susan, our oldest daughter, went to work for the video department in what? Westminster. Westminster. We had a, we had a video studio that the training people ran, uh, tech training people. So she worked there, and when Herb retired in 1992 and took the lump sum, the market was terrible, so he sent me to work found me a job working in proposals as an editor, and it turned out to be a job I really loved. It was exciting. I got to do travel a lot of different places, worked on some very important proposals like the uh, NISC, um, the FAA uh, proposal, and it gives you a really great feeling of pride to be involved in a company that does so many good things. Living in Florida was great. 
to see the missile go up and to know that you had a part in that. We were on the beach in May of 1961 and saw the first I moon think, go up. I think, I think it was the Shepard flight that was... Yeah. That, was that was great. Yeah. So. Talk about your co-workers. Co well... Uh, first is Mike. Well, the, uh, I still go to lunch with some retirees that uh, government services retirees started meeting for lunch uh, about 20 years ago at uh, a hotel on uh, Route 38. I can't remember the Landmark. Name. Landmark. And they had a restaurant on the second floor. And we had as high as 14 or 15 uh, guys would meet on the uh, second uh, Tuesday, then it became the second Wednesday of the month. Uh, they had a fire at the landmark, so we moved to the coastline. Uh, but unfortunately, our numbers kept dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. We, we got new members, uh, but, they, but they still dwindled. Uh, since it, it was kind of a headquarters Cherry Hill operation, it was uh, people from business development, people from finance, people from contracting. Uh, uh, we, we had uh, uh, some, as they retired, some people joined us, but we had more attrition than we had new people. Now it's down to a, about four or five of us. We started bringing our wives to fill in the... Uh, I counted because I had worked for Lockheed. <laughs> Uh, but Phil Melroy is one of the people who's involved, and his father worked for RCA many, many years ago. They're from Haddonfield. Yeah. Mike Camardo, who was the president of the, um, yeah, Mike's a good guy. He was a wonderful leader for the government services. Incidentally, Ned Gary, uh, Sandy's stepfather, and my father-in-law, uh, he had uh, a knack for picking good people. Him, uh, of course. The, well, she picked me. But the, uh, <laughs> no, but my father helped get him into RCA, yeah. which was a good, good thing. Uh, when the service company was staffing the TV branches, uh, right after the war, uh, television exploded on the market, and the service company uh, did all of the installation and maintenance of antennas and, and TV systems that were produced by the, the consumer divisions. And Ned and another uh, manager, Bill Zorn, they were a, a traveling team in the Northeast, and they happened to interview and make an offer to Andy Conrad, who eventually <laughs> became the president of RCA Corporation. Uh, Andy was hired as a branch manager in one of the Northeast cities. Uh, he was, he became the, he, he went into marketing for the government services. He was the proposal manager for the contract that we won at the Eastern Test Range, which was the largest contract that we had ever had up until the, up until the merger, basically. Uh, that contract, uh, had as many as eight or four thousand employees. Pan Am had another four four thousand employees. Uh, Andy lived on Merritt Island. He was the he when he was the, uh, he proposed himself as the contract manager, and he he had a boat and he would uh, take the boat from Merritt Island to uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, where his office was as as the project project Interesting manager. Interesting commute. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, how did you feel your supervisors valued what you did? Did you feel that they did? Oh, uh, I, I had some good supervisors. I had some guys I didn't see eye to eye with, um, mainly in the personnel department. And I was in personnel on two different occasions, uh, and uh, and and transferred out on two different occasions. It was just a philosophy difference. <laughs> uh, 
but the uh, in operations down at the at the Cape, uh, I had two excellent managers, uh, Ted Deuce, who uh, hired me as his as his administrative assistant, mm -hmm. and Paul Legere, who replaced Ted, and 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 hired me as the PMEL manager, which was a, a, a kind of an experiment because I have no technical background, just a business background. Uh, but they were happy with me, and when uh, uh, I left a year later, they put another administrator into the job. So, uh, How was RCA viewed by the other companies that you dealt with? The other companies? Uh, well, we dealt more with other divisions of RCA and, and with the uh, government contracting officers, uh, not necessarily with other, uh, with other companies. Uh, I think that it was a mixed bag. Uh, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the customers uh, uh, felt they, they couldn't do their job without RCA, particularly at sites uh, where there was a large program, say for the Navy, where the Navy rotated out every three years. Uh, we, we, we were, our contract was competed, but we won and we were there at, uh, at we were at, at AFOR for over 25 years. So our, our program manager uh, had a functional reporting relationship to the captain that ran the program as long as we were the, the contractor. Sandy, you may be more suited to answer this, but we hear about the influence of RCA on South Jersey. Do oh. you have any opinions on that? We flooded Haddonfield, that I know. And then the Morristown people, they all lived in Morristown. I went to grade school and high school with the children of many of the people my father worked with. They had carpools going. Uh, I don't remember any parties or anything. I was, I guess, a little too young for that. But... Um, I think Haddonfield's growth was really because of RCA. All of the people who worked in Camden and they worked in Cherry Hill, there were buses that used to go into Camden all the time. I remember even as a, a youngster being able to get on the bus and go into Camden and go shopping. They had a pennies. They had pennies had the old-fashioned um, slot where they put the money in the thing over the ceiling and they would send it to the, um, oh, yeah. the uh, where they kept the money. Mm -hmm. now, that goes back a long time. Uh, we've heard other people talk about the RCA family. Oh. Does that make it have any meaning? To oh, you? yes. They're still friends and family. I mean, we talk about the people who have been gone. They're still with us. Um, they're never gone. Even the ones that I worked with, with Lockheed, who went back to the old days, um, there's something about working for a company. They were very paternalistic. Sarnoff was a dictator, I guess, but he was, oh. that's how he made the company. You know, the company stuck together. My father worked in, uh, my stepfather worked in Gloucester City for a while. That was a horrible place. <laughs> I hated going in there. It was dingy and, and really awful. And then they moved everybody to Camden. So, no, no, oh, to Cherry Hill. That was Cherry, when they built Cherry they Hill. They built Cherry Hill and opened it in 1955, <coughs> I believe. And there were like six, originally there were five buildings and they bid, built two more buildings. Uh, they, they became the landlord for a, a lot of John Rittenhouse's people uh, uh, from Moorestown, uh, his man, his management staff, uh, and uh, it was basically a the home office for the uh, consumer services people, the DV techs. There was a group called Tech Products uh, that they went out and uh, uh, they maintained electron microscopes, beverage inspection machines, the movie, uh, the, the photophone equipment, 
uh, at, at that time, uh, RCA and Motorola were big, the, the two competitors in, in automobile radios. And we had a group that, uh, that maintained uh, uh, auto radios. We also maintained uh, what they called radio, radio marine equipment. Uh, Loran and those types of equipments aboard aboard ships, and the beginning of uh, government services was in uh, 1942 when we had technicians aboard ship maintaining uh, aboard uh, warships, maintaining uh, the communications equipment, and then later on when radar was born, they maintained the radar equipment during uh, World War II. TV was huge. I have, I remember, I don't know what year it was, I think I was still in high school, when they had a color showing of um, Peter Pan in Cherry Hill, and the families were all invited to go. And it was so exciting to see color and Peter Pan. I mean, it was wonderful. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. We had, when we were growing up, we had a TV, but the TV was the kind that was flat and it, you had to look at the mirror. It was reflected in the mirror and that was our black and white and it was a round tube vividly. I, rem I remember that. So to see something in color was incredible. It was so totally new. So that, that's also how you really felt to be part of it because they invited us in to do that. Okay, how would you um, sum up the job, RCA? Just a job, oh. career, um, how would you sum it up? Well, obviously it was the best company I worked for, ever worked for. I worked uh, uh, 32 years and a few months. Uh, they gave me a great going away party <laughs> at the... Uh, Tavistock uh, Country Club, and I understand it was the last of the big it was. Uh, going away parties after that uh, uh, they tightened up on the budgets and so forth. Uh, I, uh, I was given opportunities uh, that another guy wouldn't get, uh, technical management, uh, all those years in marketing and proposals. Uh, uh, I was, uh, I became the expert on the dew line. Uh, never, I never set foot on a site up there. Uh, I, I was he tried. On, I tried. <laughs> but every time I wanted to go on a site visit, it was the middle of a proposal and I was, and they couldn't let me, they couldn't afford the time. Uh, we had great uh, field managers, particularly the field managers in government services, uh, they, it was a, each contract was like his own little business where he had his own P&L. Uh, he did a lot of his own marketing. We helped him. We funded his marketing. And all in all, it, uh, it worked out very well for me, particularly the last uh, uh, 25 years in, in marketing. In addition to the due line proposals, my other high marks was I was the service company's proposal manager on the uh, ASMUS uh, engineering development contract that became, uh, uh, yeah, what is the? AFMAR? No, it's the Navy. Service uh, pass? No. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I can't remember the name. Uh, and. Also, uh, Joe King and I, it, in the early 1970s, we put together a proposal and a briefing for our own management to establish a wholly owned subsidiary called OMS Incorporated, which allowed us to compete better in the field engineering and field, field technician business. Uh, that uh, subsidiary, subsidiary operation was adopted by GE and then by Martin, and uh, virtually all of the employees 
in those companies are now covered by some sort of a subsidiary that all emanated from OMS. And it, it was, I'm proud of that. It's claim to fame. Did you want to? Uh... I loved working on proposals. I guess I'm normally verbose, love to write. Um, editing, I'd worked for a summer theater, I did a lot of different things, but I had a lot of pride working for Lockheed Martin. I knew that they were a good company, and because I came from the RCA background, it was, I just made the transition and transferred my loyalties, I guess you'd call it, to Lockheed. And I would still be working today, <laughs> except other things have taken a place, and so I but I did enjoy it. I worked for them 17 years. Good. My father was a, was a great guy. He started out as an engineer. He ended up in Cherry Hill in financial analysis, uh, mainly in, in the uh, consumer and, and tech side. And uh, uh, he, is, he, he established uh, some innovative ways of pricing out uh, service contracts, which was the biggest part of our, of our RCA service company's business uh, up until the merger with GE, I guess. So. Frank Diamond, do you know his name? Uh, he put together a proposal uh, to J.C. Penney. Uh, J.C. Penney wanted either RCA or GE to take over the maintenance of all of their what they call their brown goods. And they wanted to get out of the, the service business. Uh, uh, so government services loaned me to consumer services to help put together a proposal that looked like a government <laughs> response to an RFP. Uh, at that time, George Prestwich was the president of, of service company. And he was, a, he, he was a from Morristown, uh, knew what the government liked, and he liked the proposal, so uh, he dictated that uh, somebody from the government services proposal group should oversee this proposal, and I was elected. And it was very interesting, uh, particularly when it got into uh, how they priced out their service contracts, because it was much different than the pricing that we had to present to the government. Our first technicians served aboard ships in World War II in 1942, uh, maintaining a c communications equipment that was built by some other division of RCA. Uh, and uh, uh, after the war, uh, we, we became involved with uh, different defense systems, uh, different radar stations along the East Coast. I think we had our first contracts we had a contract at the Frankfurt Arsenal, uh, and it was a PMEL. And, and a, uh, a technician named Steve Heller uh, started at the Frankfurt Arsenal. He became the manager there. And when, the, uh, uh, when he got the contract in Florida, he was one of the first managers down there. And he kind of followed along wherever Andy Conrad was. Steve Heller was one step behind him. And off to the side, Ed Griffiths was be beside him. And, and they went up the corporate ladder uh, to where uh, uh, Heller uh, was uh, vice president of operations for a service company, which meant he had the tech products, the consumer services, and the government services. And then, you know, Andy Conrad, of course, what became the corporate uh, uh, CEO, replacing uh, Bob Sarnoff. And Ed Griffiths replaced Andy Conrad when he resigned. The first manager of, of government services that I'm aware of uh, was a guy named Pinky Reed, R-E-E-D. And I, I never met the man, but I've heard, I just heard his name mentioned as uh, uh, a VP in the past. Uh, the, the first uh, vice president of government services that 
I'd ever dealt with was Andy Conrad. And uh, uh, he replaced a guy named Don Kunzman, who, who I never met. Most of the executives in service company in those days were from the consumer services side because that's where the big profitable uh, operations were. Uh, government services uh, had a very low return on sales uh, up until uh, Jack Welch cracked the whip. <laughs> and we, we made you want to ask about Jack Welch and how people felt about him? Well, it, it, it was mixed. That's that great. was a well, sad well, day well, when they took the windows down. That was well, a sad the day end. when they changed the logo. And Don, Don uh, knows that. I talked to the museum in Florida. Well, I, I, en I enjoyed working for RCA. Uh, I worked in so many different fields. Uh, and uh, I, I think I, I did better. Uh, management-wise under GE, uh, but they were a lot uh, tighter with the, uh, with the retirement programs. Talk about devotion. I just thought of it. One Christmas morning, he was working on a proposal, <laughs> and he didn't want to wake us up. <laughs> we had been up a long time. We have four daughters. We had been up a long time. He didn't want to wake me up, so he left early in the morning. And as he left, he tripped going out the front door. He drove himself to work, and his foot was really, really hurting. He went to the ER. It had broken his foot. But the proposal came first, which is why he had to go. And then on subsequent days, somebody came to pick him up. So he could continue working on the proposal. Do you remember which one it was? Yeah, it was a, a, a and we didn't win the job. But uh, <laughs> when the, uh, it was interesting, but uh, when the Israelis pulled out of the Sinai, uh, the State Department uh, set up what they called an early warning system. Basically, it, it was Americans. Uh, in the Sinai, in the Mitla Pass, uh, with temporary quarters and communications equipment and so forth, dining and housing and all of that. Uh, and it, uh, the purpose was that uh, the Israelis were afraid that the Egyptians would swarm up the Mitla Pass and, and invade the uh, uh, Isra Israel. But they felt that if there were Americans there, uh, that would that would stop them, and we called it an early warning system. So we put a proposal together that, that was due early in January, and uh, unfortunately, there was another company that had the inside track, and we didn't win the job. Uh, uh, Koppelman was the president of service company at the time, and he had the whole proposal team come up uh, to get attaboys uh, after the proposal was submitted. 